Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for day one of the Chasing Excellence Conference. Um, today we have Casey Galvanic here. We're talking about setting up your athletes for success for part one. So this is a two part series um, and you will, you'll see the next presentation in the next hour. Um, if you need to catch any of the recordings, just a um, PSA, all recordings will be posted one week from today. Um, so you can go ahead, log back into Sketch, and you'll find all the recordings located here. And those are that's an infinite timeline. So you can go in in a year, log back into Sketch, and find the recordings as well. Um, for this presentation, if you do have any questions, go ahead and put it in the Q&A. I will monitor that. And then as each slide kind of concludes, we'll ask Casey um, if anything applies to that, that particular information. So on that note, I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Casey and enjoy the conference. Well, hello. I hope everybody's doing well today. Um, had a great break. If you got to have a break, it's terrific. Um, I am presenting this over two pieces. Uh, this first part should be, there will be enough time to go over some video, ask some questions, try to prime you for some questions, and then also lead you into part two. Um, part two will be more of a discussion of the implementation of what you're looking for. And then, you know, there'll be a lot of details there that I'm sure you'll have questions about. Um, but for part one, um, trying to determine where you should start with your athletes. You know, I always like to start at the end. What's my end goal and work back from there? And that's what we're going to look at. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them as soon as possible. Um, you don't really have to wait in this one. So let's move in. So there we go. Um, where to begin? You know, what really what we're looking for is establishing your technical picture. That's a term I got from a coach uh, out of Australia, Tim McLaren, and he was doing a presentation and I asked him something about what he thought the best catch in the world looked like. And he, you know, threw it back to me and said, well, what do you think it looks like? What are you looking for? And that's when he came, he said, what's your technical picture? And I've used that information and that process from the very, since that point, um, and used that as my template to work back from. Um, so my technical picture or your technical picture is going to evolve on things that are important to you. Uh, you know, rhythm in the stroke, you know, that's something that I look for a lot. How does it, how does the drive and the, well, mainly the drive, I look at the, the rhythm of the drive. What does it look like? You know, if I look at a, see a good movement in a boat or a good movement in a boat, it'll actually kind of make me move in the launch when I see it happen. Um, so it's pretty exciting that that rhythm is what I'm looking for in an end goal. Um, we talk about technique, right? Uh, se sequencing, right? Are we looking for, you know, very robotic or strict sequencing? Or are we a little bit more fluid? Or are we allowing, you know, depending on what type of athletes we're coaching, are we looking for you know, novices or youth athletes where you're trying to develop and embed a specific structure or approach to the stroke? Or are you working with athletes that have been rowing for a long time and are not truly apt to change? Um, that's the difference, like how, how does your technical picture work or how do you massage that, right? So the sequencing may change, the approach to sequencing as if, you know, you absolutely want people pure sequence legs, body, arms, or do you want a little bit more of overlap depending on the, the technique you're looking for? Um, and then also the style, right? The styles are things that, you know, people look at. One of the biggest things, I guess, style wise that people look at, I don't really consider technique, um, a big pause at the finish um, or a hesitation or a hiccup or, you know, some people say micro pause. What are you looking for? Why are you using it? What are you trying to get out of that established uh, style, right? What are you trying to do in developing your technical picture by using that style associated with the technique? Um, the speed of the boat, right? And the speed of each of the pieces of the turns, like the speed of the catch. Are you driving the blades in hard, hammering the catch? Are you a little bit softer turning with the flowing with the boat and building, 
you know, your release, uh, are you pressing through the release or are you trying to, you know, get good rebound? You know, those terms are uh, pretty used. I try to use pretty standard uh, terminology, um, but what are you looking for there, right? What are you looking, what does it look like? And that is you're developing your technical picture, right? What is that you see and want to see on the water? How are you going to communicate it? Um, some of the quick parameters uh, around that, you know, developing your picture, seeing you know, the, the technique or style that you want to see in your athletes will be determined by a few things here. Uh, drive time, right? How much time you want the impulse to be, right? Uh, on the drive, do you want it to be quick and whippy, or are you loading your body weight on the floor and, you know, prying open, getting a good hip extension, essentially laying in, laying your weight against the handle? Um, all of those things will determine or change your drive time and your approach to your ratio of rowing. So, uh, recovery time, do you are you looking for a greater ratio than one to one? Are you looking for one to one? Are you looking for a little bit less than one to one? Uh, so recovery time versus drive time, right? Though that's a, a parameter you need to look at when you're seeing, looking and developing or trying to say that you agree with what is happening on the water and in the boat. Um, then your ideal force application or curve, right? How are you, are you looking for an early peak? Are you looking for a very sharp peak? Are you looking for an elongated peak? You know, instead of a mountain, a hill, are you looking for a long plateau? What is it that you're looking for in that, in your drive, right? So that application of force, what are you, will change what you're seeing. If you're trying to achieve a long plateau, then you will have more overlap with the legs and the torso. So, you know, understanding how to get there is a very important piece also. Um, are you looking for a jump onto the foot stretcher or a toss of the handle, right? Those, those two things, when you're looking at the videos, you'll see, you know, are there crews that are spiking the foot plate or are, or are they more gentle on the foot plate early and then build and grow that, that force and then increase the speed, the handle velocity to get slight toss of the handle through the bow, right? That's a visual that you can look at, but then also see it if you're using a little bit of technology, um, if you're using Peach or, um, you know, or the bio row system, then you can see those things. Um, if you're using like a Empower Orlock, you can really see a few bits of, of, of detail there, but not everything um, to see where that jump or toss is working, right? Um, the next piece is the rate of striking. So stroke rate in your race, what is your ideal stroke rate? What boat class, right? What boat class are you coaching? Are you coaching a single? Then you're not, you're probably not gonna be rowing at a 39 the whole way down the course depending on the phys physicality of your athletes. If you have new athletes, younger athletes, you're gonna be targeting a lower stroke rate, how to optimize the motion of the boat in those, that boat class and the rate of striking, how to get that maximum speed um, out of each boat class, out of each type of athlete. If you have an Olympic athlete or Olympic athletes, you might be able to you know, their skill level is a little bit higher. Their, their physiology is a little bit more trained. They're able to move the boat quicker, have faster recovery times, have a higher strike rate of strike. Um, and then the boat class obviously affords a little bit higher ability for rate of striking. You know, if it is efficient, the faster boats allow that, the, the ratios you're looking for to be established at higher stroke rates, right? Higher cadence. Um, what I'd like to do is watch some videos and then have some questions in developing our uh, developing our technical picture, how to establish what we're looking for, right? So when you're watching the videos, I want you 
to, there's six videos that we'll watch. Um, they, I've got some set up so we can see they're pretty long. If you have any questions while we're watching, type them into the questions. Um, I can pause the video and we can talk about them, but I want you to look at the different, in the shots of the videos, the mainly from like World Cups, World Championships, there's one of a high school crew I coached about a decade ago. Um, you'll see the ratios and rhythms. I want you to pay attention to the rhythm and the drive time, recovery time, stroke cycling, right? To see like that really is the precipice. Like that's the most important piece of this. Like when you're launching into creating a technical picture, right? So seeing that, and then I want you to watch how they approach all these different athletes. There's a ton in the side-by-side -side shots. I'll do some pausing and we can revisit some shots if you want to see some or go over some video side-by-side. -side. Um, the different approaches to the strokes from any of the boat classes, the singles, the quads, the straight four, the eights, and, and really pay attention and see if you can pick out like, oh, I really want my crews to look like that then how do you shape your technical picture with language? And then how to use that dialogue to shape to the end result, okay? So we'll share some video here and uh, we will get that up. And we'll start here with a high school crew um, that I coached, I guess, 2014. And you can see, watch the approach to the catch. And of course they're high school rowers, so they're not gonna be perfect. Nobody ever is, but I want you to watch this and then we'll cycle through the videos. And if we have any questions, we'll stop. So we'll slow it down a little bit to give you let you watch because it's you know not slow rate of striking here but just watch the you know any comments that you see about the the approach to the athletes uh the their approach to the stroke and then we'll see about how we communicate that use language to communicate what we're trying to approach here right so what we're looking for here i mean you'll see lots of different mistakes one one-to-one -one athletes uh it was the red socks clearly over compressing. Everybody's got pretty soft knees. Uh, so the bodies aren't getting set really until half slide. But if you see on the turns, right, blades go to the water. We're looking for not a tremendous amount of backsplash. We're looking for a good placement, the backside of the blade to touch the water first, right? Try to get a little bit of the blade cutting through the water. There's a little bit of stall there. That's what we're trying, we've always tried to work out is the stall of the blade above the water, trying to minimize that stall, staying at pace, right? So there's not a lot of miss. We're trying to reduce the amount of slippage there. There's a quick little bit of hang there. There's good flat connection, pretty, pretty simple. Pretty simple stroke, pretty flat, pretty sequenced. There's a general legs down, legs first, body, arms, right? And that's developing that standard, right? You're looking for something that is standard and typical that you can make variations of for the athletes, right? Based on different items like trunk, trunk length, uh, leg length, arm length, whatever it is that you need to make those modifications for. All right, so this second video, so we have no questions, so I'm just gonna move on here. Um, the second video is, looks like we're in uh, Lucerne, probably World Cup three, um, to the men's straight four. And I want you to watch the difference. I mean, this is, the, the Australians were pretty dominant. Um, Watch the approach to the aggression, right at placement, hard on the legs, high stroke rate, high rate of striking. Um, 
more more so than any other team. When when you get when we get to the side view, you'll be able to see the differences, like how intensely they are placing their blades compared to the others. How direct. So we'll go back here. I want you to watch as this switches here. That far boat just warming up. But look at the aggression here. You know, do you want them to attack? You can see the other boats here in the near, a little softer turn, a little more body engaged early in that near the German boat, right? It's a little bit of overlap here. I think it's the French. Oh, can't really see. That's the British here in the second boat. Um, Seeing a little bit of legs and body, body weight. There's the South Africans there, pretty quick. Their initiation is on the legs and then their body is added pretty quickly. Now, you know, are you looking for, is your boat fast enough or is the drive time fast enough to get change your sequencing? That's, that's what you're looking for, that looking for that good standard connection, right? Loaded early hold on to the pins, release the pins, not poke the pin, release the pin, try to find it again with the next part of your body, right? You're looking for one, one piece drive, one connected to the pin, pushing, driving the pins, not pressing and releasing, pressing and releasing throughout the drive. So when you're watching, again, you can see the smooth application here of like the Dutch, very smooth, not hard on the foot plate early, very flat, looking for connection. Doesn't look like they're reaching as far out at the front end or getting connected at the same angle. There's definitely a turn on the footboard in place. It's a very good connection. Um, and you can see it's just smooth. They lift a little bit with the shoulder. Well, these athletes are lifting with the shoulders a little bit to place the blades, the Dutch anyway. Um, and getting that connection and that drive rhythm, right? So you see how the Germans there hook and really press and lay into it. Look at the Australians, legs, blades in hard with a hard press. And it's pretty unrelenting. Um, you can see the differences. I mean, it's, you know, these athletes crushed it this year. Um, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So you got to make sure that what you're looking for is what can be translated by the athletes to the water, right? Being very effective. Um, there's the Dutch again, looking very smooth and looks like they're not even trying. Um, it's pretty typical. They're looking for power application in the middle of the drive. I don't know the exact angles, but I've heard different numbers from certain catch angle to release angle. So they're really not blasting on the foot stretcher while they're placing the blade and they're not yanking on the handle during extraction. It's a good mid drive application of force and you can see the smoothness that you get out of it. Um, so in that video, does anybody have any questions about either of those first two videos? trying to use them to develop what you're looking for? Or are you looking for something specific? I don't see any questions, so I'll move on. So we're here at the women's single. It's a good shot here. We'll let it play through and then I'll come back frame by frame so you can see Different athletes you can see here, German athlete, placing, pushing, getting that, uh, doesn't look like it's a real flat controlled handles at the catch, going a little deep. I think we got a question here, so. Yes, there's one in the chat. Um, can you comment on the propulsion in terms of total time of the blade against the water? Yeah, um, so you're, I, I'm gonna, you might need to clarify a little bit, but propulsion in terms of total time, total time of the blade against the water. So I 
consider that the drive impulse, right? So if that's what you're looking about, looking for, I can answer that. So what I'm looking for in certain boat classes, right, based on stroke rate or rate of striking and also the boat speed of the boat class, looking for a certain amount of drive time. So if I'll just throw out random, pretty random numbers and easy to work with. If you're looking for a drive time in a boat class with an athlete that is half a second, right? How are you utilizing that, that drive time, right? If drive time is when the bottom edge of the blade touches the water and you're looking for load till half of the blade is out of the water, right? That's when you're gonna stop pressing or when I teach to stop pressing, that's your drive time. How are you going to utilize that time, right? So my blade, am I going to, as you saw with the last video, right? Let me pull it back up here. With the Australians, right? It's pretty aggressive at the turn, right? At placement, right? So that time they're looking for as quick a load up against the pin as possible, right? And there's a lot of principles around that in sense that, you know, if you've ever read anything with bio row or whatever, it's about minimizing the duration of check and minimize it, the value of check is higher. The peak recorded number of check is higher, but the timeline of the check is lower, right? So you're getting, a, looking for essentially a, a upright trumpet shape of check instead of a long bowl of check. So that's what the Australians are looking for, that quick turn, no, no wasted time to pressure. Some people are looking for how fast do you get to, I think this was uh, Valery Kleznev, um, how quickly are you getting to 70% peak handle force, right? There's been studies that show getting the faster you are to 70% of peak handle force, uh, those boats are faster over time. Um, I think the study he used was maybe the British men's eight over the Olympiads. Um, but that we're looking for how much work can be done in that stroke, right? So that's the, the time, the duration. Um, now, are, you, are your athletes physically capable of jumping on the foot stretcher and not being overburdened with that, that change in direction? Because when you slam the blade in, Remember, your velocity is going to be high. The blade, the boat might not be going fast enough and you're gonna get a little bit of stall, right? So I spoke to, we were talking about get, making sure that you can push through that wall. That's the amount of force that you're looking to find, right? So I, I said that to, I think John Graves one summer and he said, yeah, we use, the, we use the term, don't start what you can't finish, right? So once you get that little stall, so finding, how much pressure you can apply and keep applying and keep moving and increasing your velocity, which is also then increasing momentum, which is increasing the force against the pin. So if you get that, if you apply too much and you come to a stall, then you have to restart your drive. You're overburdening the body, right? You can essentially put your body into a shock. Um, and then you are getting a two-piece drive, right? So your impulse, you'll see your curve go up there'll be a hesitation, a flat line, or even down, and then up again. And that, that power curve can be, uh, that, that same shape can come from a lot of things. Overburdening the body at the, at the loading of the pin, or you know, getting the blade to bend. It can be your, when you open your body early and your legs are stuck beyond 90 degrees. Um, and then, uh, it could also be that you are not capable of engaging. There's lots of things, but here are the three that I would use. Anyway. Engaging your glutes properly to open up and utilize the posterior chain, right? If there's a hesitation between the time you're on the balls of the feet, the coordination to getting the heels down and en engaging the glutes, hamstrings, and lower spine, uh, the erector spinae, that is, can also create that little hesitation in the, in the curve. But Again, looking for that smooth, I would teach, all right, or you need to look for the curve that, if you can test, <laughs> let's start. If you can test and look for the curve that mimics what you like to see in the 
on the water stroke, then that's what you're looking to do, right? So in the part two, we look at some video I took um, a long time ago where, I guess I get into, where I took uh, my camera, synced it with the software on a, uh, the uh, Rode Perfect, the RP3, and we were able to change and modify the, the power curves based on limbs, limb length and how tall they were and short they were and all these different factors, right? So we were looking to get the same duration of stroke, right? So that everybody's time was the same and also trying to get the peak handle force at the same time. Um, and I did that instead of, instead of rigging everybody to the same stroke length and then just rowing like robots. So we're looking for how they can apply the force to get the peak handle force at the same time, instead of just rowing the same stroke to get the same time uh, timeline, because the peak forces can be different even if your timeline, overall timeline is the same length. Um, so what we're looking for in that total time, I guess I'm gonna try to get to the final answer here is we're looking for an increase in velocity of the handle throughout the drive, not some falsely created velocity change, right? But like whipping, if you're able to whip, then that means you've lost the pin at some point in the drive and you're trying to find it again, right? So there's a loss of connection. So we're looking for that nice, smooth, connected press and save for half a second. Well, if it is a half a second and you have very trained athletes, then you can have a ratio that's a little different, right? You don't have to have, uh, you know, two to one. I know there's a lot of us that coach, right? Take a stroke, count to three. Count to one on the drive, count to three on the recovery during practice. Um, what you're looking for, race cadences are pretty much going to be one to one or slightly lower, right? In the bigger boats or faster boats. So as you can see in the Australians, they're going at it and it's low, their recovery time is less than their drive time. So you aren't going to be able to do that with novices or, you know, I don't know, freshmen or unless you train the heck out of them and you're not most likely not gonna be able to do it for 2000 meters. So you're trying to find the rhythm that they can physiologically handle, right? And then once you have that part of your technical picture, that half a second drive time, right? Because that's what they're capable of handling. Then how do I, go back and change my rig to allow, if I want my boat to row at a 34, a 32 or whatever it is, how do I get the most out of that half second, right? Um, so I, I need to then adjust the rig, maybe make it lighter, shorter stroke so that they have that impulse for half a second that's, that's useful and not overburdening and then have enough time on the recovery to physiologically recover between strokes, right? So if we, as you well know, if you tried to row at a 55 stroke rate from the start, you're going to collapse at some point. And that collapse can be catastrophic. Um, so we need to make sure that we ma manage our energy input and the amount of time that we allow between impulses. Um, John, I hope that I covered the question. If I didn't, please retype it again. But I, there's a lot around the total time the blade is in the water. Perfect, that was a lot of talking. Hopefully a lot of my talking can answer a question. Um, so again, we can look at this video before we move on to the single again and just watch when these people, here's the South Africans and mainly I can tell just because of the reach stick. Um, you can see how quickly three seat and two seat open their bodies against the legs. I'll try to go back here so it's not blurry. Um, you see the differences in the boat. And I don't know if the coach is trying to do this on purpose or if they're, this is just how they learned to row and this boat ended up being the fastest boat he could put together, right? So watch stroke seat. Shoulders are pretty relaxed. He opens up a little bit, but he's on the legs more. And we'll talk about the ratio of legs versus torso later. 
And then you see the position of two and three, see how their shoulders are now behind their hips. They're opening up, have their body weight hanging from the handle already. They're not driving their body weight onto the handle at this point. They're opening up, they've extended, right? And those small adjustments, right? And we talk about, do you, do you get your technical picture? Like does everybody in your boat row exactly the way you want them to row? Probably not, but the, good, the thing that makes a good coach is being able to adjust what you want to see and getting your athletes to do what needs to happen so that they move quickly, right? Um, an example is I coach this uh, women's double and I got a lot of comments about how, you know, they rode it differently. And, you know, again, one athlete's 5'5", five, five, one's 5'10". Five, you're going to you're going to need to make certain adjustments and whether it is whether it is rigging adjustments, which is not the greatest thing to do all the time, I found um, small rigging adjustments are necessary, but just applying how they their sequencing, changing the slight sequence will allow their, you know, again, their handle forces to align. And that's the number one thing, right? How do we get your handle forces to align? My number one thing. If you have, so part of my technical picture, and this is the dialogue, there was a terrible movie, uh, I say terrible movie, years ago, um, and it was, I think the name of it was Tank. And at the end of it, the tank got stuck in the mud and they need, they were trying to cross the state border and they tied a rope to it. And I guess, well, I'm gonna estimate a thousand people got onto the rope and they all pulled at the same time and they were clearly able to move the tank. Now, if each person went up individually and tried to pull on the rope, nothing would happen. So just that simple explanation to my high school athletes and even the older athletes, because I can't come up with any better stories, they, they utilize that and start to understand, oh, so everything has to be in time. And at the same time, we have a magnification of our forces instead of, you know, walking up to a truck and trying to pick up a truck by yourself, you might get the shocks or the springs to extend. But if everybody went over to the truck at the same time, they could pick it up, right? So that simple thing, like how do you get these different or disparate body types to have the same impulse position and time on the timeline? And that's what you're looking for, but then also your technical picture, how does it line up, right? How do I take what I'm looking for and then modify those with minor changes to get all of those things to align? Um, so, and then, you know, again, this is racing. So I'm sure the coach is not saying I want, I teach two seat, to come lead out of the bow at the shoulders. It's a race for life. They're gonna do whatever they can. I mean, at, the, at that point, right? The splits going down is all you care about. So um, that's a big, you know, a big thing. Like we're watching some video of people in a race. They're gonna do whatever they can to win. So here's a good side shot of the Dutch. A lot of overlap. Oh, this is not going to last very long, but you can see the blades. We talked about it in that first video um, with the high school crew. There's some stall. They square, right? They're squared. The blade has stopped traveling towards the bow. And now the blades go down and towards the stern to bond with the water. They get connected. They have a softer turn good connection, there's overlap with the legs and body, right? And if anybody wants to see anything again or talk about it, you can put it in the notes. But again, here we are looking, and again, this is the coming to the last 500, I guess, or no, last 200. There's the finish line. And you see they're throwing at 
they're trying to hang on. They've gone out very fast and they are hanging on very well. Still see how aggressive that turn is, right? See how controlled the turn is, the difference in look of those two boats, the Dutch and the Australians. I mean, it's, it's pretty impressive. Like the, there can be such differences in rowing, but they can all accomplish the same things. Um, back to the women's single. If you look across, right? Look at different sequencing, different body positions, right? If you, you can see, I think Kara Kohler's in here in the far lane, and then Sunita Paspera. If you watch their sequencing as we're doing this, you can watch those two for sure. They place the blades with a definite drive of the legs and extension of the knee. The priority is get the hips moving, right? Near what we would consider shooting our slide, right? Nice flat shoulders, nice flat sternum, push, push, load, and then the body gets very active at half slide, right? If you look at the at lane three, you can see the body opens early, right? This athlete is probably the shortest person in this field. She won 2017. One of the best pictures I ever saw was, uh, was her at, in Sarasota in 2017, just laid into it, no care in the world about what it looks like, but she was flying and connected, just laying into it. Um, here's a question. Mentioned stall a few times, and what have you found most effective drills to minimize the stall at the catch? Well, that's a good question. Um, and it's the stall at the catch, what we do to minimize that is pause at the finish. So um, people have made mention about like so that's I've been teaching that for, I guess, since like the mid 90s, a pause at the finish um, with the sole purpose. At, the at that time, now I've learned some more things and more ways to use it, but the sole purpose of the pause at the finish was to get the recovery time and the management of the foot stretcher at the turn properly, because that stall comes from pressure in the foot stretcher, right? So at that point, if you've established your bodies, you've lengthened your arms, then your knee joint, right, the compression there is what is determining the speed of the handle and also the tip of the blade. So what we have done is lots of placement. We do placement drills. We work on using language to set mental pictures for people. Um, there are lots of drills to use. I, you know, you can put a sponge under people's feet so they can feel the compression in the shoe um, as they're approaching the catch, trying to keep the sponge extended. We use sponges for a lot of other things, but that you could use. I always tell people there's two things, a tube of toothpaste. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. You're trying to keep it in the tube on the recovery, right? And in severe cases, I've put toothpaste in a boat with somebody and said, don't squeeze out any toothpaste until the bottom half inch of the backside of the blade touches the water. And that way you can start managing that turn. Right, and that turn is all managed with the foot stretcher. Well, we're, we're trying to teach all of the turn in and out of that placement managed with the foot stretcher. So everything else is still in silent. Um, placement, teaching athletes to not be afraid of that placement and getting like going from overly backing the blade in and creating splash to finding that right timing for the speed of the boat. I'll do a uh, you know, like pause or finish to catch placement drill, but then I will have them place at different positions. I'll place it half slide and back to the catch, place it three quarter slide back to the catch, 
place at seven, eight slide, whatever, a little tighter back to the catch so that they get comfortable with that feeling of resistance when you're overdoing it. So you don't fear having to catch your body weight on the foot stretcher. But the, the other thing that we talk about is it is your duty to not press the foot stretcher, not to slow the roll of the person's seat in front of you, right, in the team boats. So we talk about things that I've used language-wise or, you know, metaphors or whatever, um, used like drawing the boat, making the person's wheels in front of you roll, like drawing with the top of the foot stretcher. Um, I don't know if every, any of you are old enough to have had those little motorcycles and cars that had the little plastic zip toy that you put in and wound them up with the zip. I talk about you are the zip and the per your partner or the person in front of you is the car. You're trying to wind them up. So you're pulling, constantly pulling on the recovery and keeping that speed. So we want the blade not to hesitate. We want it to flow to the water without interruption. Now, how do you get that to turn? Like if you're early, right? The first thing we talk about is being early, the one stroke is, is fine. Make a correction with the, your recovery speed for the next stroke, right? If you're there early, slow the hands down, slow the body down, slow the slide down, decrease the draw or pressure on the top of the foot plate or foot the shoe into the catch, right? So it is a, you want to feel as if like going into that last quarter or eight, as if your feet are outside of that binding pressure of flexibility of your Achilles. You wanna feel as if you're in a void. You're not really affecting the boat one, or, one way or the other. You've already kept the boat at pace. The blade tip is at pace, goes to the water and you turn. And that, that skill gets developed certainly over time. And it's something that we work on a ton. Um, very much so that's a drill that or those drills of placing and drawing placing and squeezing so that they don't rush up and catch themselves on the foot stretcher right so loading the foot stretcher with all of your mass and your momentum that you create on the recovery with no reprieve from the blade in the water and holding some of that suspension or getting that pin pressure it's not neg negated so all of your mass loads the stern and drives the stern into the water which it slows it down. So we're looking for good speed, keeping the stern out of the water with keeping the pressure in the foot plate towards you. Again, as if you're compressing a spring rod between your foot stretcher and your sternum, right? Squeezing, compressing that into the catch. And then we talk about relaxing at the turn instead of kicking or stomping on the foot plate. I like a softer build. I don't like to overwhelm the body. As the boat speed comes up, obviously that has to speed up to match the speed. So you're not just checking the boat down, but that coordination comes with time, right? So we're looking for that compression of relaxation. I have used compressing a beach ball between your heels and the seat, right? Compress it all the way into the catch and then relax first while you're setting the blade in the water and then build. Um, something else that I've also used to keep that pressure off the foot stretcher and stop the stall is imagining, not every kid knows what this is, but a bellows, imagining a bellows is under the foot stretcher or under the shoe between the shoe and the foot stretcher. And you're trying to stoke the fire as best you can. So there's a long draw on the foot stretcher opening up that bellows and you wanna keep opening it. You don't wanna use the foot stretcher as a break and push some of the air out so you won't be able to stoke the fire on the drive. Right. I know this sounds kind of childish, but these kind of things help people give a mental picture of like how that draw is supposed to happen. Nice continuous draw, get as much air in the bellows as possible, turn on it, and then stoke the fire as best you can. And a lot of it, I know you're looking for drills. Those are good drills that we use. Um, and then just a lot of it is language. Like, you know, we make the kids watch the blades you know, look at your blade and I want you to feel what's happening in your foot stretcher and see what is happening to the tip of your blade. Is it what you think I've told you to do or I've explained to you? And then, you know, there's hopefully some back and forth and they say, nope, I can see it stopping. 
and then they can start associating that stop with pressure in the feet and nothing else. Right. So we're trying to clarify that. I hope that answers your question. All right. So we'll get to the videos again. Janine here is, I mean, just as you can see, there's a lot of overlap immediately. Extension of the hips right away. I would assume they discuss making sure that the heels are down and not opening the hips until the heels are down and your knee joint is close to 90. You don't want to, you know, stall your leg drive or fatigue yourself having opposing muscle groups working against each other. So you'd want to wait. But you can see here, pretty customary sequencing, a little bit of a when she, stiff shoulders placed in the blues, but I don't know why I would critique it. So it's flat, mostly flat, almost every stroke. Letting the blades cut the water, getting loaded on the face and the backside of the blade, and remembering that the blade works almost as a wing. You know, utilizing that knifing through the water to increase the ability to load the pin without tearing the water. And that's a big thing. Once you start tearing the water, there's no way in a race situation you're going to be able to uh, re engage the water. So you lose pressure and it's wasted effort, not efficient. You can see the patience that everybody does have, making sure their blades get loaded. Here's a good side by side. You can see the difference and see the chain. Well, great. Um, I want you to watch the stern tips maybe for, your, for a second. And see when the blades stall, what happens to the stern. And there's no avoiding the stern dip, a slight stern dip, especially in a single. There's just no, no way to do it. Just watch the sterns. And the different approaches, right? If the blades are in the air, you should not be weighting the foot stretcher, right? If you're weighting the foot stretcher, you're driving the stern down into the water, which is gonna slow you. But again, we're talking about developing your technical picture, not analyzing video, but looking for, you know, again, looking what you see, are you, are you interested in your athletes rowing in these ways? You know, what's the rhythm you're looking for? We'll move on to, I talk a lot, so we're gonna move on to this eights video here. Get a side shot. You can see right away, look at the Australians. I want, if you notice again, hard on the legs, right? The Americans, there's some art on the legs. Big send, big toss. Canadians, that's a lot smoother looking, right? Again, I'm not judging one or the other. They all are successful, clearly. But they're getting all of their approaches in line. I'm sure that at some level, at some point, these coaches are talking about making sure that the efforts are unified. So, you know, I, I always say like, you take a, a singular picture of any crew at any time, there's probably a lot of, lot of stuff going on that you no coach is saying, absolutely do this. But that's why picture review and video review is pretty hard, but at least you're getting a sense, hopefully you're getting a sense of, when you see these side-by-side -side shots, you can see how it looks and how it appears. like. Do, do the Canadians look good to you? Is that something that you like or is their handle speed not increasing fast enough visually for the, for the end of the stroke for you? Do you want more of a toss, right? And this is, this is what you need to look at and then see how it rewards your athletes in their speed of their boat, right? Aggressive, right? You can see a big toss here from the US. 
right? You see the Kiwis in the far, far side. There's, you know, different, different approaches in the boat, but you see that mostly in the middle of the boat, everybody's connected. They lay the body weight against it. They push, they pry, they open up and then release the water. It's pretty simple. There's not a whole lot of thrown body around trying to make up for lost connection, right? And again, you know, you're trying to develop your picture. What is it that you want to see, right? Do you like to see, do you like that aggression? Does teaching, you know, does it change the mentality of the athletes when you approach, like, I'm not gonna leave a single, single centimeter out there for anybody to judge and say, I wasn't really trying to work hard, right? Or are you going to row, what I would say, are you gonna row smart, right? Are you going to overdo it, burden yourself, waste energy, or are you going to utilize the momentum you've created, right? And a lot of this is sliding the boat along, just maintaining, right? So when you see these videos, I think the other video I had here, I said six, I have five, it was another of the eights because it was a good difference of approach Just that nice, again, that Dutch rhythm, like if you watch, just connection, laying, putting the body weight onto the handle, opening up, it almost looks, really truly looks a lot effortless to the Chinese, a little more leg focused body, a little more still on most of those athletes. Um, really it's, you know, again, one way or the other. Um, what I wanted to do, um, is, let's shrink this back here. Um, well, questions you guys have been asking, but understanding like, what is it that you want to see is the basis, is the basis of what you should be coaching, right? And how is it that I utilize going into the second class or second part of this, like how is it that I utilize things and what do I do to change or make sure that what I am teaching is effective, right? I, one of the examples I, I like to use is if I, I mean, we go out and do lots of steady state, say 18 stroke rate, um, and we'll do, I get, Tom Terhar gave me this like one little thing we do just to create some competition at the end of some practices, and it's like 10 20s, uh, 10 10 strokes at a 26 full pressure and we use it to work on the things that we've been working on that day all right so whatever we our focus was technical focus or application we'll really focus on it at full pressure to 26 and if they're if the kids are not um if the kids are not they're just trying to win the 10 strokes there's a lot of cheating that goes on right in a 26 everyone here knows that if you increase the time in which you apply force on the drive, right, by opening your body early, keeping driving the legs, opening early, like it's gonna increase the duration. So when you increase the duration and you're stuck at a 26, a duration of impulse, and you're at a 26, you're going to beat somebody who is most likely rowing what their race stroke length is, right? Again, at a 26, laying way back, adding length to the stroke, hooking as long as they can. But if they're at a 26 and they're rowing their race stroke length, you're really gonna have to be good to, to beat somebody who's cheating the length and cheating the, the change in impulse, right? So we'll see a lot of that like, oh, well, the second varsity is beating the 1V. Well, yeah, the 1V is trying to do work on the things they're doing and implement our technical picture. And the 2V is trying to win, which again, I'm not so sure I, I'm totally against it, but I would like them to learn a little more. But that kind of thought, like at a 26, you might be able to increase, you can't increase it to a, probably can't increase it to a full second and an eight, but you're increasing your impulse from 0.43 seconds to 0.82 seconds, well, that's a lot more duration of impulse, right? So there's more work being done on the drive. Your recovery speed is going to have to be a lot faster in that person taking 0.8 seconds on the drive. So their fatigue level is gonna go up, right? So in a race situation, if I said, 
I want you to do all that you were doing at a 26 and do it at a 37. Well, those people are probably going to be ragged at about 850 meters in. So, you know, getting that, making sure that they're applying your technical picture to all practices is very important. Making sure that they're not cheating. So they're not seeing, oh, when I do this, I see the splits go down and you can have an answer for, yeah, there's a reason for it. And that happens at every level. Um, it happens every day during steady state from pre-lead athletes, college level, U23s into our high school kids. And I'm sure the masters as well, but um, you gotta make sure that they're implementing your technical picture. And then as we'll discuss in part two, how to like, if your drive time, because your, your technical picture is opening your body a little earlier, how, how to change the rig or change whatever it is to make sure you are, that your athletes are now physically capable of executing what you're asking and getting out of it what they want. Um, does anybody have any questions? Any, anything left? It doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat right now. Um, maybe they're saving them for part two. Yeah. <laughs> Casey, is there anything left that you want to leave on? Otherwise, we really. can wrap I mean, up. That's, that's about it. I'm, you know, part two is a little more, you know, involved, but understanding the idea of starting from this is what I want to see is something hard to communicate to a lot of people. So I think it's very important. You know, this is the important part. This is what I want my crews to look like, you know. Awesome. We did have one last one come in um, from Harry. So do you find yeah. a different style works better with a different sized athlete? For example, open early for a shorter crew? Yeah. So, I mean, what I will say to you is we'll show you some video in the next one also, but in 2012, I started working on this modifying kids power curves, right? Um, before I had essentially rigged every athlete, no matter their height, weight, whatever, to rig them so that they're the right positions for their drive. And it you know, worked, obviously it's not a bad thing to do, but when I started modifying their power curves by telling shorter kids to open their bodies against their legs a little earlier, we were getting the timing right. So what I'll talk to you about is developing those changes in the part two, and yes, like you'll see the video of the difference in one, the shortest athlete in our boat in 2012 and 2013 and the tallest athlete and how, the steps I went through to figure out like how we needed to change it, change each one of them to match the boat, set the standard around somebody who's in the middle of that and then start changing everybody else. And we had more fluidity and much more speed. That's still, I think to this day, that's the boat that went the, got the boat moving the absolute fastest out of everybody that we've had. Um, wasn't, well, I mean, it was in Oak Ridge, so we had a little bit of flow, um, but that was fast. And then, you know, they were a mix. I mean, the tallest kids like six, four, shortest kid was, five, eight, and they, they moved really well once we got those impulses aligned. So there wasn't a lot of wasted energy. So absolutely, um, opening early matches an athlete, right? If they're rowing a single, you, you really, you don't have to make them change. You just want, if they're rowing a single, anybody can win. We saw that at the Olympics. So um, rowing properly is a good thing. Again, a single, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Um, as long as you're a genetic phenom. So, um, yeah, so there is some difference. There definitely is some improvement when you make some changes, but awesome. I wouldn't have somebody open their body against their legs in a single, if, if they're short, I would change the rig first. Perfect. Well, Casey, thank you so much. This is great. Um, as Casey mentioned, there's a part two. So in 15 minutes, if you want to hop over to that Zoom room, um, there are also two other sessions that are finishing up right now. So again, if you want to watch those recordings, that'll be available in one week on Sketch. Um, but Casey, thank you so much again. Um, and everyone, thank you for attending and we will see you in the next room.